Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our eighth Ducks Unlimited Canada Marsh Masterclass. Tonight, we're talking about waterfowl. Again, waterfowl ID 201. If this is your first masterclass, welcome. We're glad to have you. And for those of you returning, welcome back. I'm very pleased to have all of you here. Our major donors, our volunteers and supporters are critical to making us uh, successful. We couldn't do our conservation work without all of you and without our partners at the provincial, federal, uh, government levels, our First Nations partners, and our partners across North America. So thank you for all that you do. So as uh, all of you were getting uh, entered into the meeting, I recognize uh, many of the names. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm Cynthia Edwards. I'm the Chief of Major Gift Programs for Ducks Unlimited Canada. And I also work with our uh, partners in the U.S. and Mexico on cross-border development. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, you might have seen this uh, messages. This uh, session is being recorded, uh, so please be on your best behavior. We have several breaks for questions throughout the evening. Uh, if you have a question, please enter it in the chat box and I can read it for you or just uh, put a note in there to ask me to unmute, uh, get you to unmute yourself and uh, you can ask it directly if you'd rather do that. So, of course, as we enter into the fall season, fall is a, a very special time for those of us who are keenly interested in waterfowl. The fall migration brings an amazing spectacle of birds right outside our back doors and, and watching them move across the continent is amazing. So to help you make the most of the season, we've launched the Ducks Unlimited Canada Migration Tracker. As a valued part of our conservation community, you can help it take flight. The Migration Tractor Campaign is a nationwide citizen science uh, effort that encourages us to record the birds that we see outside our windows or wherever you're out enjoying the outdoors. So you can join uh, on the iNaturalist. Uh, you can learn more at the website there on your screen or in the chat. And you can show off your newfound skills that you're going to learn tonight. So we'd really rate, uh, appreciate it if you could uh, take a look at that. I understand uh, when the invitation went out that many of our attendees tonight uh, actually did the quiz uh, that was included in the invitation. So that's great and a great primer for tonight. So for those of you who've been participating in our master classes for a while, this is a follow up to Waterfowl ID 101, which we did last October. <clears throat> so once again, we have our own resident expert, Pat Kehoe with us this evening, along with renowned ornithologist and author, Richard Crossley. So Pat, and I'll um, warn you that this is a relatively old photograph. <laughs> Pat, Pat, is our, I am. <laughs> Pat is our director of international partnerships. And I know many of you with us tonight uh, know Pat for his hunting skills, his uh, storytelling ability and his culinary expertise. So uh, welcome back, Pat. Um, we've really missed the opportunity to like stand in the back alley at the Bella Vista and Humboldt around a char, char boil, char coal grill and uh, and enjoy some fruits of the fall hunting season. So with Pat tonight, we have Richard Crossley. Uh, Richard grew up in England and like many of us, his fascination with birds started early at around the age of seven. He's traveled the world uh, studying birds and is the author of the Crossley ID guides. We'll talk a bit more about that later. Richard has just completed two new books, one focused on the identification of Western birds and the second entitled Ornotherapy for Your Mind, Body and Soul. So Richard, we're glad to have you back with us. Oh, it's great to be back. Pat, you're looking really lean and mean there. You know? <laughs> Did you eat all those, whatever it is you've got there? <laughs> I've eaten a few of those in my day, for sure. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is the result. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, um, we're going to dive into hybrids, molting, plumage variants, and how to distinguish drakes from hens, which is really important given the upcoming hunting season. So I'm going to turn it over to Pat and Richard to get started with the discussion. Yeah, I mean, a bit of background on Richard and I. We met about seven years ago. I was working in Edmonton and... Uh, Got a call from Carla Gwynn. She wanted me to take this British bird watcher out. And I said, what the heck did I do to deserve this? So Richard <laughs> showed up at the office and we took him out into the field. I took him out to the field today. It was a great, 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 uh, great day. We saw a lot of different birds, hit it off very well. And I'd say that was seven years ago and we've, uh, we've connected ever since. So Richard, over to you to fire me. <laughs> 
No, I, I remember, well, it, it was an afternoon thing, right? And then the next day you sort of rocked my world, to be honest. So uh, <laughs> you taught me so much and, and really, uh, yeah, really emphasised just how much DU does. So I was coming from that birding fraternity where we we blissfully live in ignorance sometimes. It was a real eye-opener and uh, it was really inspiring to me to see just how much Ducks Unlimited Canada and Ducks Unlimited period does. So uh, um, since then, I've obviously been connected to, to you and uh, speak very strongly about just exactly what DU does and how we need to to learn a lot from from all the great work. No, you've definitely been a great ambassador and, and, and good plugs for us in your books, including pictures in our, of uh, some of our sites in your books. So we appreciate that support. Yeah, well, but we're going to talk about molting tonight. A lot of people tonight. don't know this, but DU Canada, you, you were so inspirational that day. Not since, of course, but you were so inspirational <laughs> that day that actually uh, DU Canada has the distribution rights for, for the Crossley ID Guide waterfowl. So anybody who wants the Crossley ID Guide waterfowl needs to get, and you're in Canada, you have to go to DU Canada. So uh, so that's, I think that says, says it all, really. That's, that's great. Yeah, I appreciate that too. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about molting. We're in the fall. A lot of birds are in uh, waterfowl, especially in grab plumage. They're tough to tell apart. So we're going to try and talk a little bit about why the birds molt and how to tell them apart in, in these various plumages. Uh, basically, ducks uh, and geese go through an entire body molt twice a year. Some would argue. Oh, That's come on, different. Pat. They don't do twice a year. They're molting all the damn time. They just there you go. every now and then, <laughs> okay, to, just for a rest because they're, you know, they're doing something that takes lots of energy. But I think, Pat, they're actually molting. It's easiest to think that they're molting most of the time and every now and then just, just suspend it, I think. That's probably a good way to put it. I, I mean, I've done a bit of tax during my day and, and, Throughout the year, birds have pin feathers. They're always replacing, but there's these real twice a year highlights when the bird is in, particularly the male in, in waterfowl is in full ad, adult plumage, breeding plumage, they call it alternate plumage, uh, or eclipse plumage in the summer this time of year. And what's happened is the ducks and geese will lose all their flight feathers during the summer and become flightless. In that period, the males take on more of a female plumage as camouflage because being flightless, then they're very vulnerable to predation. So one of the, one of the things that's really interesting, Pat, is you know, is it breeding? So we call it, I call it bright plumage. So in winter, the males are in their spanky colours, right? In lads, because they want to pair it with a nice female, right? So, so, but is that breeding plumage or non-breeding plumage? Because in summer, when they're breeding, the males go into this eclipse plumage where they look really drab. So there's a lot of contention whether it's breeding or non-breeding plumage. And frankly, it's probably best to use neither of them and just call it bright plumage, you know? Well, I know we're, we always have to put it in boxes, right? And put a nice little tick to it, label it. But it's best to call it, I think, bright plumage. And then in summer, eclipse plumage. Because ultimately in other parts of the world, the way ducks behave and molt is really quite different. So no, that's, that's a good point. And as you go through different books, you'll hear all these different terms, natural plumage, like eclipse yeah. plumage, breeding plumage, alternate basic plumage. But you know, just to think of it as you say, bright plumage, because that captures that that period of time when the, yeah. the males are in full show, uh, or eclipse when they're more female-like and all birds are brown as they are up this time of year. Yeah. Uh, probably is a good way to think about it. Yeah. So one good. of the things about molt too is, is the males in, in ducks especially will leave the females once the the, the nest is laid and the, uh, before the ducklings come out and they'll go off and usually take a northward molt, molt migration. In Canada for example we see a lot of drake wood ducks when the hunting season opens. We don't see too many females or hens. Well that's because these drakes are coming from breeding areas further south and coming into Canada in the summer, molting, and then get first flighted when they're when they're on the molting grounds in the north. And similarly, prairie nesting waterfowl will take molt migrations up into the boreal and even the, the low Arctic to, to undergo their molt. So the males will leave the females in ducks and, and go off and molt. In uh, geese, that's not true. They molt together as family groups in the, in the summertime. 
Yeah, I think in nature, you know, the most important thing in nature is food. Food is the driving force for everything. You know, so birds need energy to breed, to migrate, to molt. So actually, the food is always, in Ju July particularly, is always better to the north. So I don't think it's just waterfowl that actually go north in the middle of summer to molt. I think actually a lot of small birds do as well. So if you're looking for warblers and things like that, I think, you know, you go to their breeding grounds in July and it's like, where are they? Where are all the young? They've all fledged. I think actually a lot of a lot of birds, not just waterfowl, go to the north because there's more food. And so I always think of food as that, that driving force in nature because they need that energy to do everything. And that, that sort of simplifies it um, when you think of it like that. So we've got some slides. This, these are obviously your mallards. You've got the, the drake in, in bright plumage uh, and the hen in, in the dull uh plumage that hens have year round, largely because they need to nest and raise young. They're vulnerable to predators, so they want that camouflage appearance, whereas, as Richard has said, the males in spring and late winter are trying to show off to the females, so they take on this more showy or bright plumage in, 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 uh, in late winter and into the spring. Now, these are, are drake mallards uh, in eclipse plumage. Uh, you'll notice a few things. You know, typical mallard Drake pictures have a bright yellow bill. Well, again, when they're in, in molt, their bill dulls down in color, becomes more greenish, takes on almost that, that black saddle that you get on female bills. Again, all part of the camouflage they need when they are flightless. But they're only flightless for three to four weeks. This eclipse plumage persists, what, Richard, about three months in total or three to four months to cycle through? Yes, so a lot of them, yeah, they're growing their feathers in and uh, it, a lot depends on, on really what the food is like, how quick they can molt. Um, but they actually look like young males as well, so it can be quite confusing whether they're actually adult males or young males because they're all, if it's a juvenile, it'll be brown just like a female, just like a male in full eclipse but then they start growing in these bright feathers. So actually being able to age the young males from the adult or eclipse males is actually very tricky, Pat, right? Well, yes, um, there's some keys on that, that bird up above showing the blue speculum and make me think it's an adult male. The, 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 the key would be the tail, it uh, would yeah. be white. I, I've got my, yeah, so it's, uh, the males have a white, the adult males have a white tail, whereas the juvenile males would have more of a brownish tail. But where the wing is raised, you can see how sharp and crisp those, uh, those tertial feathers are, those longest feathers that stick out most of the back on the wing. And just ahead of that, you can see a really frayed feather. Well, that would have been the, the basic or the, uh, sorry, the alternate plumage or the bright plumage feather that's badly worn. So that's another reason they molt. Those feathers, with all the flying ducks do, get very worn and they have to be replaced to make the next round of migration, whether it's winter to, to, to the summer breeding grounds or the other way around. And that's why, as Richard says, it's more of a continuous cycle of molt than a, yeah. than a discrete cycle. Yeah, I mean, not only for, for flight, but the, the feathers are really important for, you know, to keep them warm, to keep them cool. And again, waterproofing. So if you have a waterproof coat, right, and you've been wearing it for a year or whatever it is, it gets worn off and it becomes less waterproof. Feathers, the same thing. So that's why they've always always changing them. And what's a little confusing, we always thought that they went from really dull feathers. So when they molted again, they automatically got the really bright feathers. So you could always see this difference in the feather type. Well, we now know sometimes they may have brown feathers and then guess what they molt? They molt it into another brown feather. And so we can't see that. It's really hard to see it. So, so that's why sometimes they'll keep molting and we can't really tell that they're molting because they don't molt this new bright feather in that contrasts with the old brown feather. So that's why sometimes it's confusing. But if you're confused, don't be. Because we all confuse, so we still learn. We're all sort of all the experts like Pat and that. We're still learning this stuff. We really don't know about it, so uh, we're all beginners. And believe me, the more you know, the more you realise, the less you know. So, uh, but that's the fun of it. Not knowing is actually fun because that's 
a great opportunity to discover new things. Uh, this is just illustrating uh, geese in various forms of molt. There's one hybrid there in the middle that uh, has a white head. But if you notice the bird up front, that's a juvenile Canada goose. And, and you can tell that by the sort of the weakness of the flank feathers, those feathers along the side. If you compare that to the darker bird, just two above it, the feathers are much more crisp and defined. Those, those, those light, light feathers are, are birds. That's their, the first set of feathers after down that that bird is carrying. So it, it gives a very uh, almost rough appearance to the bird rather than the smooth, slick flanks that you get on a, on a full adult goose. Yeah, and the big thing, Pat, is the size of the feathers. Those juvenile feathers, when you compare the size to adult feathers, they're always a lot smaller. They always look really neat. So if you look at the bottom bird, look how neat those lines are. They often have paler fringes. But, you know, the, the juveniles, it's the only time in a bird's life when all the feathers are grown in at the same time. Okay, it's the only time. That's not just for waterfowl, but for any other bird. So all the feathers are exactly the same. And uh, as I said, they're small in, in, in geese, they're smaller and, and rounder. Adult feathers are always more larger and squarer. Um, and with practice, and you know, it's really quite easy to see. So if you're in, your, in the town park or somewhere out in the wilderness, if you're lucky enough to be there, try and get groups of birds where you can compare one another. And you'd be surprised what you can see. And, and just like what Pat said, those fluffy feathers uh, on the flanks are really striking. Birds, all birds, really, they try, they're in a hurry to get out of the nest because the nest is a really dangerous place, even for big things like geese. But for small things, particularly birds that nest on the ground, because right, coyotes and foxes, right? They'll go into the nest. So you want to get out of that nest as quick as you can. So you grow your feathers as quick as you can to escape, right? And so they're not built very well. So they, they tend to fa fade very easily. And in fact, small birds, really small birds, chickadees, they're even in even a bigger rush because they're even more vulnerable. Big things like eagles that nest on tops of trees and that, they don't give a damn because nothing's going after them. So, so they grow their feathers much slower and much stronger. So it's really, that's a pattern for all birds, not just waterfowl. But when you understand that they're in this rush to get out the nest, it, it really makes sense, you know. So back to mallards, we, we talked about them a, a little bit. Uh, it, it really, the, the striking thing on, on some of these birds, uh, I've heard hunters comment, there's something wrong with this, this mallard when they see a head like the one on the upper upper right. Well, no, that's just a, a, a drake that's molting from the, uh, the eclipse plumage into, into the bright plumage that they'll carry through fall and winter and into the next late fall, winter into the next spring. One on the bottom uh, right is is a is a male in, in eclipse, and again with that bright white tail, you can tell it's a it's an adult male as opposed to a juvenile, which would have more of a muted tail closer to the female, but even a little more browner than the female on the bottom bottom uh, left. Yeah, the the male, the bill pattern is a really big one, right, Pat? But there is actually a a bit of a well a little of a, a bit of a confusing thing, and it's called senescence. So senescence is where old females, the hormone levels change. And actually the bright colors of the male are, are, are dominant and the, the female's hormone levels suppress those bright colors. But as the females get older and the hormone levels change, they often start to get the bright, brighter colors of the male. But remember the females always retain a female bill pattern, which is sort of orange with a dark center. And so if you see a, a, a funky looking male like bird, like the one top right, but it's got a female bill pattern, that will actually be an old female. So, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a tricky one. It, it is. They're, they're fairly rare, though, in fact, but they, they aren't uncommon. We get pictures sent in asking what's this bird quite, yeah. quite frequently on, on that. Senescent but, female. But, but the bill pattern's key, right? So even with eclipse birds, always look at the bill pattern and the wing pattern. So in, in eclipse plumage, the males still have that that wing pattern of, of the bright bird, the big bold wing patches, and, and typically a much brighter bill pattern. That's it, and I think that's an important point. If you see a bird that you 
you can't identify. It's, it looks weird. Try and get as many pictures of, of angles and, and you know wing spread if you can, because that speculum on the wing is very important for, for bird identification. But it's very tough sometimes when we get just one picture of a bird in and we're asked what it is. You get as many as you possibly can in different angles, because there are a bunch of different cues, as you'll see as we go through these slides tonight that we look at to try and pin down exactly what a bird is. Yeah, and take lots, because again, iridescence is a big thing, right? So a mallard's head is green when the sun is behind you, but a mallard's head is purple or black when you're looking into the sun. Or if you look at the ones on the right, it's sort of a mixture of bluey, green, purple when it's at 90 degrees. And it's the same with the wing packs, the speculum the, on the secondaries. Those colors go from anything from in a mallard from light blue to dark blue to purple. And just the slightest tip of the wing changes those colors. So as Pat said, lots of photos is the key. Hey, wood ducks, one of our most showy ducks. Uh, the drake unmistakable in, in full plumage. The female more muted, but again, a pretty striking color pattern on, on the female. In eclipse, they look pretty dull. But again, as Richard said, with the, the senescent female, that bill color doesn't change too significantly. You can still pick up that uh, that wood duck drake bill in, in both those birds in eclipse plumage. The one on the left, uh, I think, is a juvenile male, would you say? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So how, how neat it looks on the, on the breast. Um, you know, the juveniles, again, because they're all the same age feathers, they look much, much cleaner and tidier. Adults look ratty, you know. But one thing about wood ducks that I always like to tell people, where do wood ducks one. live? Wood ducks live in the woods, of course, right? So wood ducks have a long tail. That long tail is, is a rudder. And so, so they're able, that helps them steer through the trees. So bird's shape is always to do with the environment it lives in. So wood ducks are just like sharp-chinned hawks or cooper's hawks and raptors. They live in the trees, so that tail helps them steer in and out and around the trees. So it's Another to... point on wood ducks, you think that is a, a, a very bright, gaudy bird. You put that wood duck in the in the forest, it, it virtually disappears. It's amazing what kind of camouflage that is. Yeah, yeah. Different yeah, tones and, and different reflectivity of those feathers, and it just blends in with the the foliage in the trees when they're when they're up uh, trying to nest. Shovelers, right. again, the drake, you know, very striking bird. Uh, the, 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 the bird below it is a, is a drake in eclipse plumage. And, uh, you know, again, taking on very much similar pattern to the, uh, the female. Do you think that one's a juvenile or an adult, Richard? Yeah, I mean, the Irish color looks quite bright. So I would imagine, usually I would imagine it's an adult, but I'm not. That, that'd be my guess. The other thing, if you look, there's absolutely no flight feathers, no primary feathers. Look yeah. at the bird above. You got the long primaries. I think that's an adult male in, in yeah. full eclipse. That is full flightless period right there. Yeah. But also note that the bill is lightened a little bit. I mentioned with the, the mallards, uh, it's still basically a black bill. It doesn't have the, the bright orange of the female, but it has lightened a little bit to aid in camouflage. Yeah, you see the top left one, Pat. You know, that looks like it's in absolute you know, full bright plumage, right? But if you look yep. in the white patch, just, just above the waterline below its head, you'll see some little little brown flecks, uh, like half moons. Um, yes. There's like three of them. So if you actually look at shovelers, they invariably have those all the way into January or February. So they're never in real complete spanky plumage till till February, you know? So uh, we always think that they're all immaculate by October and November, but if you look closely, they very rarely are. And that's the same with a lot of other ducks. Lesser scorp, you can always see these brown feathers in. Greater scorp by November, they are usually, you know, strutting their stuff in their brightest colors and uh, immaculately, you know, white flecked. So yeah, each, each duck is different, but as I said, I think they're often molting for much of the year. Um, so very interesting, but shovelers interesting as well. Those big spatula bills, they they just change the old taxonomy of it all changed recently, right? So blue wing tail, cinnamon tail, because of that spatula bill and those bright wing blue wing patches. Now blue wing tail and shoveler are lumped in with the same set of birds as shovelers. So, so that's sort of interesting. Again, showing that things are always changing, which proves that we. <laughs> don't know as much as we think 
And the interesting thing of that is you go back to some of the books from the early part of the 19th century, they were lumped over there at one point and then they moved. So this taxonomy and, and even uh, taxonomists who study what the birds are, how they're defined, who they're related to, can't necessarily keep it straight through time. So the reason there's confusion in identification. Yeah, well, it's changed since we've got on the air, I'm sure. So there you go. <laughs> But you know, the smart people didn't do their books on taxonomy. They actually did it on habitat. But we're not mentioning any names, are we? Okay. But, but other books are actually going to follow that moving forward. So, you know, everything in nature is in response to the environment. So if you look at the environment, you can sort of work out what the birds are going to do. Like that wood duck, it lives in the forest. So it's got those incredible colors, but also that long tail. For navigating so i think it's good to look at nature like that and you know that it responds to where it lives rather than the other way around mick anderson has a, a quick question here can you comment on the blue wing versus cinnamon uh teal in eclipse so i think we're going to get to that we're we're, we're right question. there <laughs> great timing okay Simply, so i told you not to allow questions like that <laughs> so we, we've got uh we got a set of blue wing teal here. Uh, obviously, the drake with the, the bright uh, crescent and the, the female on the upper upper right. Uh, you know, this is one that actually we had a discussion as we're going into it. Is it, is it a blue wing or is it a, a cinnamon? Cinnamon teal have a very spatulate bill, almost like shoveler shaped, and you can see that picked up a little bit in this hand. But Richard and I talked it over, and I think it's pretty much sure it's a it's a blue wing hen because the bill is shorter the, the the cinnamon teal bill would be slightly larger but the hands by plumage including the wing are virtually indistinguishable uh it, it comes down to habitat you, you see the the cinnamon's more in the west as you get into alberta eastern alberta there's about one cinnamon teal per 20 pair of uh of blue wing teal. If you get down into Cardston Lethbridge country, it's almost 50 50 or greater in terms of, of cinnamons. To, so, where you are helps you identify. But a Drake uh, cinnamon in Eclipse will have that bright red eye, uh, bright red or orange eye of the, the adult Drake cinnamon. So, you can tell the Drake adult Drakes apart, but the juveniles and the hens are very difficult to tell apart except by location. And actually, if you have two in the hand, there is a longer bill on the uh, cinnamon than on the uh, the blue wing. Richard, what, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the juvenile males they usually start getting the red iris by late September, October. So that's a giveaway. I, I look at cinnamons and they, uh, they're sl maybe slightly bigger on average. And that bill, again, is, is a bit more spatulate, a bit longer. But it's, it's, it's not striking often and some are really questionable. To me, the overall tone of the bird is the big thing. You know, they're just, the females are, um, they have some warmth to them. Whereas to me, uh, blue winged teals are always cold or gray brown. And, and they only, in juveniles, they have a bit of warmth, but never really like a cinnamon teal. So while I'm not the biggest advocate of using color in ID, in this case, it's really useful. And, and again, just that a little bit more flatter headed, a bit longer build, but it's all very subtle. And then sometimes the real trip up is iron oxide or rust staining. Sometimes you'll get a blue wing tail, particularly a juvenile, because the real juvenile, the feathers absorb water more because they're not as well made. So they absorb the rust staining in the water. So then they can get quite reddish. And that's a real, in the East, I've seen more than once birds be identified as cinnamon teal when really they were just juvenile blue winged teal that had absorbed the iron oxide in the water, making them rusty. A tough one, real tough one for everybody. Yeah. But it'd be very uncommon to see a, a cinnamon teal east of uh, the central flyway in North America. So, you know, when you get in the Mississippi and, and Atlantic flyway, not impossible to see, but, but very, very rare. Mm. Pintails, real showy bird again. Uh, the, the females are actually, they're pretty striking in their own in terms of a, a female dabbling duck with the longer neck and, and uh, really cool shades of brown, I think, in, in those birds. They're one of my favorite in terms of a, a female duck. The drake in, in, uh, in the bottom left is uh, in eclipse is, uh, 
You can see it's got some Drake characteristics. That is the white breast is starting to molt back in. But other than that, it's pretty much the, the, drab, uh, the drab plumage of the eclipse bird. Yeah, it's got that striking bill pattern as well, right? With a really dapper with a black line across the ridge of the top of the bill. Um, whereas if you look at the hen, the female on the top right, you can see the bill's much more muted pattern. Um, yeah, and again, you know, you look at the drake in bright plumage, the bill's almost blue on the side in eclipse. It, it still retains the pattern Richard talked yeah. about, but that blue is faded to a, to a more of a gray color. Again, camouflage advantage. Yeah. Now, when you start getting to whether it's a young male or an adult male, it's tricky. And it's even trickier when you don't know, um, you know, so if this is in June or July, it's pretty straightforward. But when you get to September, you know, where it could be a young male or an adult male, then it really does, does get tricky. And I think most people struggle with that. Um, there are some other clues, you know, if you, as Pat mentioned, if you can see those juvenile fluffy feathers, and a good place to look for those juvenile fluffy feathers is on the rear flank. They tend to be, that's a place where they're malted out last and they're, they're really quite obvious. It's usually above the water line. And then another thing as you go through the late fall, those juvenile feathers are retained in the tail usually. And the tail feathers in, in first year birds gets really worn and really pointed. Um, so if you get a good look at the tail, that can be really striking as well. Pretty easy to pick up in the hand if you're hunting a bird, but on, on the wing or on the water, it, it can be a little more challenging. But say, if you get out there and, and observe birds, even, even in your local park or wherever you, you can get close to birds, it, you can start to pick these things up. Yeah, that's the best place to study is the place when you can walk up to stuff and really see them up close and make sure you're right. And then, then it gets easier to do it at distance, you know, and, and particularly that fluffy feather, the juveniles, it takes a while to get your eye in on that. But when you do, it, it can be quite obvious, right, Pat? So some that aren't so obvious, I've got to turn this one over to you. because. Uh... <laughs> Are you turning this one over to me? No, there's nothing like some pressure, right? Yeah, you wait. I'm going to pay you back for that. All right. Okay, well, I've been well, leading buff here. So. Buffalo heads are spanky. One of my favorites. Okay. So the, the adult male on the top left, look at the different iridescent colors of that head. Okay. And then the females and the young males. So adult female, young female, and, and young male, all of these brown heads with white cheek patches. But males are interesting. So in waterfowl, maybe a bit like us as well. Males have big heads. And in and, and some species, you can really see it like gadwall. Look at gadwall's head. It's huge and looks squared compared to the female. And buffle head is another one that once you get your eye in, you'll see the bold, spanky adult male has got this really big head. But actually, you can see it in the young males as well. So if you see like three or four brown-headed, white-spotted, females or juvenile males if you can look closely you'll see one will have a bigger blockier head and the white ear patch is usually a bit bigger and that, that will uh, be a young male a juvenile male and it will stay like that through the first year of its life and then usually about may it'll start getting smolting in some white feathers and through the summer and then it'll go into a clips like the adult male and then you know by the late fall it looks bright and spanky again uh, but again if you look at that nice uh, male in the bottom corner um, again look at those big bold wing patches so that's another good way in the middle of summer to to age it as an adult male eclipse if it's got a big white wing patch just to add to the confusion on some of this stuff when you get into the sea ducks uh, like the eiders and scoters and even golden eye not all of them will molt into full adult male plumage in their second year. Some species take two to three years. And then golden eye gets a little more confusing because some will molt in their first year into, into full bright plumage, but others it'll take two years, depending on what time a hatch is and probably some of the genetics of the individual. Uh, so, so that's another little twist when you get into the into the sea ducks. Mm -hmm. Most of the, the traditional puddle ducks and, uh, and, and traditional diving ducks, the cans, redheads, uh, and, and scop, go through that full molt within a year. But in the sea ducks, which tend to be longer lived species, it can take a little longer for them to, to reach maturity. 
they're also bigger. It's like with other birds, the bigger the bird is, the longer it takes to molt to, to adult plumage. So like with big gulls, seagulls, they take a lot longer to molt to adult plumage than, than small gulls do, you know? So again, these patterns really, I know we're looking at waterfowl, but they actually transcend to other groups of birds as well, most of them. And this, I think, is an illustration of what we're just talking about with the, with the seed X. We've got the adult male harlequin on the on the top uh, the top left and on the bottom uh, right. But if you look at those two birds, you can see a bit of a difference, uh, particularly in those uh, white feathers along the side and the, the the tertial feathers on the on the wing just towards the the back of the bird. See how worn those are. I think what we have here is a uh, adult drake that has just molted, probably November, December, maybe January, and then a drake that is is uh, carried those feathers into probably sometime about April, May, about to go into molt on the bottom bottom right. Those feathers show a lot more wear. You can see that they're duller overall coloration than those freshly molted feathers of the bird on the upper upper left. And then we have the hands and a a drake and I. What do you think of this one? I think it's probably a, a first year drake in 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 the, the next uh, the next spring or, or late winter. It's it's not quite full plumage. It you may not have Which which one are you looking at, Pat? The, sorry, the bottom the bottom left, Richard. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm going to tell you, young males and eclipse males look remarkably similar without seeing different subtleties like nuances of tail shapes. But if you knew what month it was taken in, the photo was taken in, it would be be a damn sight easier so if this was like taken in july august even september you would basically know it was an adult male in eclipse if it was taken in in november or something you would actually know it was a, a young male um so the 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 timing of the malt is, is quite different in young males to adult males but i do i do believe that would probably be a midwinter Harlequin. So the, all those brown feathers, are the, re, are the retained juvenile feathers look really worn, and the darker feathers are the adult type feathers that have been molted in. But I, I would think that was taken in the middle of winter, maybe February or something like that. But then and again, the, the Harlequin's a very showy duck, but you put that adult drake in a mountain stream where they breed. Yeah. And it just blends in with the rocks and rapids. It's amazing how quickly a bird that colorful, when you look at it in a picture like that, can disappear in the wild. One of the right. best birds, right? And they're so tame, right, Pat? You can walk up to these things and they have their little squeaky toy calls. I mean, they're just, they're one of a kind. I, I think they're insane. You a know, great duck, know? yes. Oh, in Europe where they're really rare, I mean, people go absolutely <laughs> gaga for them, you know? They're just- They do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I've got a few questions rolled in. Um, one is, will cinnamon teals hybridize with, with blue wings? And I know we're going to get to hybrids in a minute, so I, you might want to hold that question. But Short answer is yes. And we'll, we'll show yeah. one in a minute. What okay. if I'll a horny thing, son of a bitch? They'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll, you know, they'll do it with anything, you know? Uh, I had a... Look, everything is mated with everything okay so, <laughs> the, the question is is just yeah. how regular it is and I, th I think blue wing with cinnamon teal is fairly regular and probably more regular than what we think because they're quite hard to differentiate some of them tell tell right them the hybrids or not right um uh next question was what's the function of the Alula feather. I might. I probably pronounced that wrong. Alula. Oh, you got it. The Alula. Wow. <laughs> well, I give my thought, Richard, and you can Go correct me or, or change it. <laughs> I, I think it's just an evolutionary. It's a vestigial uh, set of of basically fingers. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's on the the very end of the wing, and uh, there's feathers there, and it's almost a it, when you dissect the bird, it's a it's a separate bone with fingers, and I think it's a vestigial evolutionary thing from when birds turn from two birds from from reptiles way back yeah i've heard that mentioned before i have no idea if that's right or wrong it makes and sense. i've i've given the answer then let's move on <laughs> right. well, you what know pat said more than me, then, yeah. <laughs> uh 
Uh, we have uh, one more question before we move on to the hybrids. And so Elizabeth asks, uh, uh, going back to the Harlequins, yeah. uh, indicators that differentiate the Harlequin hens from the juvenile males. Yeah, so the, the, the juvenile male always has a ghost pattern of the adult male, you know, so you know, it'll, they grow in adult type feathers like the, 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 the crescent and uh, some of the darker feathers on the back really quite quickly in the fall. So it's only in when they're in the fresh juvenile feathers, which is in the summer, that they look like females. So by September, uh, you know, when they go down into the coastal areas and things like that, you'll start seeing these, uh, this ghost pattern. Basically look Great. like very, very grungy adult males. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. I think- like I us. <laughs> I didn't say that, so- um... <laughs> I knew people were thinking it, so I jumped in. <laughs> <laughs> so I know uh, we've got a few minutes to, to talk about some of the hybrids that we've uh, we've put a few examples up here. So well, you, like your, your comments right on is, the, Your bottom right is your answer on the on the blue wing cinema. There you go. Yep, exactly. Yeah, they're, they're, cover another one? They're, they're fairly common. Well, they're not that common. They're nothing like mallards and black ducks, but uh, we should- Which is the upper back. left. Yes, yeah, go to the top one, upper left. Mallard black dove. I'm going to tell you right there, that image there is, is a bit of a tough one. Now, often when they're mallard black duck hybrids, they actually usually show a bit more of a green cap than that one. Um, so that could actually be a back cross. You can see the little black curly uh, things on the tail there, two of them sticking up. That's a good mallard character. Black, black ducks don't have that. Um, it's a male because of the bill pattern, right? So, I mean, do you think that's just a straight hybrid or do you think that's a back cross? No, I, I, I think it's probably a back cross. That's a, that's a point to make on hybrids. Most hybrids are sterile if the birds are not closely related, but mallards are very closely related to black ducks, Mexican ducks, and uh, mottled ducks. So those hybrids of those species uh, are often mostly fertile and, and will interbreed back to either a, a parent black or a parent, a parent uh, mallard and, uh, you know, in the following year. And uh, you get a whole series of intergrades of mallard black ducks. But generally, the, the, the uh, legal uh, uh, distinguishing features are, oddly enough, a black duck has more than 11 dark feathers on the underside of the wing. Uh, and a mallard's underside of the wing is pure white and it's the two white bars on the speculum black ducks do not have two white bars on the speculum they'll have a often a trailing edge a very narrow white bar but the the leading edge of the speculum the, the patch on the wing uh they they don't have a white bar but if there's two white bars on a on a, on a hybrid then it's considered a or two two black two white bars on a bird it's considered a hybrid not a not a black duck the ex hybrids are extremely common in this what we call complex. So Mexican duck, which was until last couple of years ago was a, a subspecies of mallard, is now split and considered a full species. So Mexican ducks are found primarily in Arizona, you know, along the Mexican border in that neck of the woods. Um, actually, all the literature was wrong. Uh, supposedly, they... Uh, Mexican duck has less white border in the speculum, but I think that's wrong. Birds in the northern part of the range, where we are, actually have as much white as mallards. Um, what's interesting, though, mallard is, my goodness, is that adapted to man? So they're they're really a dominant bird, in, in particularly in the east. But females of, of and males of Mexican duck, uh, mottled duck, and American black duck, they look very similar, but mallard's the one different one where the male mallard is incredibly bright and spanky. And ladies, what do you want? Do you want <laughs> dull or do you want bright and spanky? Well, unfortunately, all those females want bright and spanky. They want some of that green stuff, right? And so it's a major conservation problem because now all these birds are hybridizing. So in some areas, it's even hard to get purebreds. It's that common. 
because these females like the bright stuff so much. So it's a real problem. To look for hybrids, I would just reiterate what Pat said, but a big thing to look for is white in the outer tail feathers. So most of the Maxi Mexican model black, they all have sort of dark tails, but if you look for white in the outer tail feathers, that's a big thing to look for and is, you know, basically tells you it's a hybrid along with those little black curled up feathers. Here you go, Mal. Pat, this is all for you, mate. Well, I'm gonna, I, well, I'm gonna put a plug in because this is, this is a plate out of your book and, and your book is excellent at showing birds in different flight positions. And of course, there's the plug for Okamak, Okamak right front and center in your, your book. So, so thanks for that. Yeah, it's just, I mean, we, we can't, we don't have time to go through all these individually, but it gives you a, idea, particularly in the puddle ducks, what a range of hybridization can occur. And some of these hybrids are very rare. The mallard pintail and the mallard, which is on the upper uh, upper uh, right-hand side, is a, is a fairly common uh, hybrid, as is the, uh, the, the, the mallard uh, gadwall, which is on the lower, the one that's standing there on the, the muskrat mound with the, the, uh, the yellow feet. Uh, that was actually common enough that Audubon called that a brewer's duck. I mean, it was it was collected in his his time. So uh, those two would probably be the most common uh, hybrids amongst the uh, the puddle ducks, other than the mallard black duck, of course, which is which is uh, very prevalent. But in terms of this page, those would be the most common, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you think? I mean, you get into some of these other ones like the uh, the widgeon greenwing. That's a pretty rare cross. You know, it really yeah. doesn't happen that often, but often enough that people send in pictures to, to DU or elsewhere to try and get these birds identified. And it can be challenging, as I say, if you don't have a complete set of set of pictures. It's, it's always better later on in the winter and you know, when birds are molting eclipse in early fall, they look, oh, you get every different permutation and odd looking thing. So it's better when they're in the full bright plumage. When you see something odd, then that's when you really really want to take notice and uh, like Pat said, take lots of photos. So, so we put together a few, uh, a few photos here to, to help uh, stump the pros. So I gotta go. <laughs> and I was, Don't leave me. Don't I was leave thinking me. about the, the comment about multiple photos help. Well, we've only got one photo of each. So, uh, oh. Goodness. Like to like to start maybe in the in the top uh, left and your thoughts on that one. The top left, well, it's a goose, <laughs> and, and uh, it's def I would say it's got uh, snow goose and, and white front and probably blue phase uh, snow goose in there. The one thing that's a little confusing at it is on the the white cheek makes you think Canada, but I'd say bill shape and over, overall shape of the bird puts it as a, as a uh, white front blue goose. What do you think, Richard? Yeah, I think you're right. It's got to be a white front, right? Because of that, that white blaze around the bill and the bill looks right for that. And again, then you go to the colors, but this is it with hybrids. Hybrids waterfowl are a real pain in the tush, to be honest. Am I allowed to say that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So and the other thing I'd throw out about that bird is I'm guessing it's a juvenile. Uh, again, it's tough to tell, but just looking at the shapes of some of those feathers, it may be a late season juvenile, but I think it's a juvenile. And remember, I, I mentioned the sea ducks, but the, the geese also take two years to reach full plumage. So that mm -hmm. further confuses you on this bird. But I, right. I, I think Richard and I are on, probably on the same page yeah. that it, it, it's a, it's a blue, uh, a blue uh, white front cross. All right. What about the, the top right, I think? That's where we'll top right it. Go ahead. Well, it's got a lot of shovel in it, right? So uh, after that, so this is hard. When you're looking at photos, an individual photo, it's hard. It's clearly a lot of shoveler, if not all the shoveler. So the real question is, is it a hybrid or is it just a funky looking shoveler? Because if you look at male shovelers in Eclipse, they can look like absolutely anything. They're all over the gamut. Um, but I think that speckling, the dotting on the on the chest makes me and the crescent. Blue wing now, although although with Drake shovelers in different plumages will show that white crescent. Yeah. I'd say that's a shoveler blue wing. 
Yeah, I mean, so they're quite, if you could see the size of it, is it smaller? And that would sort of put right. a nail in the coffin. Um, and, and you look at the shoveler to the to the left of it, that bill is a little bit smaller than that other shoveler head poking out there. But again, it'd be nice to see the flip side. Of, well, the wings on this one wouldn't really tell you much, but the, the tertials and other feathers would also give you a key. So again, it, it's tough from one picture to really pin it down. Yeah, well, I think shoveler blue wings are pretty. Uh, so what's safe. interesting? It's got a dark iris pat, so it's not an adult. It looks like we're right. They just flashed the answer up there, so <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> okay, we're we're gonna go to the bottom bottom left then. This one's a tough one. I'm. It's definitely a diving duck, and it sort of overall screams redhead. Uh, I I guess it's a it's a hen. Uh, redhead, uh, probably with a with a, a scop cross. Impossible to say whether it's greater or lesser. Probably lesser because they overlap more in habitat and range than breeding graders. But that that would be my guess. And it's also, you know, fairly late in the spring. The ve green vegetation and those real worn feathers on the shoulders there uh, suggest it, it, it's about due to go into molt to me. Yeah, those pale feathers though. That you know. It on the rear flanks and even on the scapulas there. Yeah. I mean, that's unusual, you know, so that looks like those feathers are really heavily abraded and, and atypically worn. They're, they're unusually pale there. Um, yeah. So I would agree with this, a redhead scorp hybrid. Um, Let's see what that is. Redhead unknown. There we go. <laughs> All right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now you know. So let's move know, on to the next one. <laughs> I know we had... Um, we had some of our staff at Okamic kind of, you know, help us with this. And, and they kind of said the same thing that you'd said earlier that like, sometimes we just don't know, or we don't, there's not enough evidence from one picture or the lights wrong or. It, it'd be nice to see about. a speculum on that bird and see how much white there is on the wing you know, all that kind of stuff would really help in the identification. And we're assuming that's a North American shot. I mean, if that was somewhere sure, else yeah. in the world, there's all kinds of other birds in those genus that genus. And even in North America, you can have escape birds get out from captive flocks and breed with wild birds and end up with right. hybrids that are, that are real stumpers. Yeah. All right. Last one. The biggest thing that in real life that photos don't show is size. You right. have to know the size relative to other birds. It's everything. So if that's along with some other birds, it's exactly the same size, same shape, right? But then it's got all these really worn feathers that are bleached out white. It's probably the same species as the other ones. You can't see this in the photo. So it photos <laughs> make it really hard for me, you know? What's the next one. Good? Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's, that's yours, Pat. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think I think it's a, 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 a at least a partial albino mallard. The reason I think that is, is the, the the shape of the bird overall, and, and the the it could be a domestic bird, but the shape is a, a, domestic birds generally have heavier bills and and heavier legs. That's a pretty lean, mean looking looking duck. Right. So I I think it's a wild wild duck that's. Uh, not fully albino, otherwise the bill and feet would be pink, uh, as would the eye. But that, that one's a tough one. It could have a lot of domestic, but it just doesn't look quite like a domestic to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, mean, I would say 99% certain means you don't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you 100% certain? Absolutely not. You don't know. All right. Awesome. Well, I think... Uh, I don't see any more questions. So we're gonna we're gonna move to contest time. So uh, we'll be giving away. We've got a few copies, five copies of uh, Richard's ID guide for waterfowl, and we've got a quiz on the next page. And so we need you to send your correct your contest answers to info at ducks.ca, and the we'll pull a. Uh, five lucky winners out of the, the pool of correct answers and you'll get this wonderful book in the mail. So here are the three and uh, just put them down in an email. Don't put them in the chat or everyone will know and uh, and send them into us at info at uh, ducks.ca uh, as soon as you can by the, by the end of the week and uh, we'll close the contest at the end of the day on Friday and let everyone let the lucky winners know next week. 
All right, we'll keep that up for a minute. Um, and if you do want to keep learning about bird identification, uh, please do check out uh, the website at uh, crossleybooks.com. Uh, get your ID guides there. Um, and if there's, I don't think, I don't see any other additional questions. So get your contest info in. And I'd just really like to thank Pat and Richard again. It's always great to, uh, we learn so much in these sessions. And I know uh, there were lots of folks I know who uh, were unable to be with us tonight and are looking forward to the recording. So that's, uh, that's always good. And um, I know we could be here for hours with the two of you uh, talking about these things and, and deciding who's right and who's wrong. So I'd like to thank both of you again. And then also just thank our guests again uh, we really do appreciate your taking time out of your busy days uh, to to be with us uh, we hope you have a great hunting season coming up I know it's uh, it's uh, looking a little bleak on the prairies with with drought but hopefully all of you are going to be able to get out and it, at least enjoy some of the the fruits of the fall so thank you for all that you do for wetland conservation and please do get your quiz answers in and we'll see you next time on March Masterclass number nine. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night.